Welcome, brave souls, to the chilling depths of horror and detail. The realm where the shadows whisper ancient secrets and nightmares come to life. I am your guide through the darkness, and on this channel, we delve into the spine-chilling world of Wendigo horror stories that will send shivers down your spine. First Story Where the Wolves Walk Upright there is a place in the backwoods of the high country where there aren't any towns or villages. It's too remote for all, but the most rugged of settlers. For those who dare to venture into the dense wilderness of the frontier, they practice caution and security. No one hunts in the forest alone. It's not a very desirable location to be stranded in after the sun goes down. All of the locals know it. There's all manner of enchanted spirits and wild beasts haunting those woods after nightfall, and not all them are benevolent. The mysterious wolves which roam the forest and howl at the moon are said to traverse completely upright on their hind legs. From a distance, they supposedly bear a remarkable resemblance in the erect posture of human beings. Many hunters swear to have witnessed seeing those unnatural creatures lurking about. They are said to surround their prey in highly organized hunting packs, just like ordinary wolves. The primary difference being that they track and trap their prey from a seven-foot-tall, standing vantage point. Villagers in the nearby towns are a superstitious lot and took this sinister canine legend to heart. I never gave their fanciful folklore much credence until I saw one of the feral beasts for myself. It crept around an outlying cluster of hardwoods at the edge of the woods, near the faded light of dusk. My jaw dropped and the hairs on my neck raised up. As soon as it saw me, it wrinkled its snout in an aggressive, toothy snarl. I feared that I was going to have to fend off a violent attack, but in the end, it retreated away slowly. I'll never forget the startling sight of a fully standing werewolf, massive in size, stepping backward into the safety of the tree line. What black magic sorcery or mysterious act of the Lord was this? The fierce look in its coal-black eyes spoke volumes. You stay inside your territory and I'll stay within mine, was the message. Being so close to the wretched thing filled me with a chilling dread. Could I really trust that it and its brethren would hold true to the unspoken truce? I had no way of knowing but from that day forward. I forbade my children from stepping foot into the woods after sundown. Even the most obedient children are apt to misunderstand or not take parental warnings seriously. In the back of my mind, I always carried a lurking fear of the possible consequences. Naturally, my sons and daughters failed to understand the true reason for my strict, unexplained directive. I didn't even try to tell them about the horrible abomination I'd witnessed. Being labeled a forbidden place made it even more tantalizing. I caught all of them stealing longing glances at it from time to time. The devilish mystique of an unfamiliar territory was slowly seducing them. Each day the temptation wore down their resistance a little bit more. The greater the opposition I raised to the damned labyrinth of beckoning trees, the heavier their curiosity bore upon them. All too soon, the situation I dreaded came true. I awoke to find that my eldest two children couldn't resist the allure of the woods any longer. They had crept outside to explore it, apparently. Their beds were vacant, the candle box was missing, and the hen eggs were still uncollected from their chicken coo chores. Calling are their names at the edge of the woods proved futile. They had too much of a head start wandering the dense highlands. I gathered up my rifle and gunpowder pack for the unpleasant task ahead. An occasional drip of congealed wax upon fallen leaves confirmed their path. I was relieved to feel that it was still a bit warm to the touch. That was a sign they weren't too far ahead. By mid-morning, I had picked up and lost their trail several times. Other things were active along the well-worn deer path. 
The disturbed leaves and brush I found wasn't proof of their presence any longer. They would have blown out the melting candle with the full rise of the sun. From there, the wax trail went cold. I yelled and shouted their names until I was hoarse. Only a mocking echo bouncing off the nearby canyons answered me back. I considered doubling back to the last confirmed evidence of their trek, but an unknown force inside me kept pushing onward. In the blackest heart of the highlands, only wisps of sunlight can trickle down to the leaf-strewn floor below. I was deeper in the forest than I'd ever been into the dense wooded canopy. Suddenly, I felt a significant presence nearby. A dark entity was watching. I turned to face the same ferocious mongrel which had haunted my nightmares since the first day I saw it. This time the standing alpha leader of the pack wasn't alone. I was surrounded by a half dozen other attackrity wolves. He snarled while the others remained silent in hierarchical respect. I had my gun at the ready, but could only take out one of them before the rest pounced on me. He was the obvious choice for my musket volley. When the leader of any rank and file organization falls, the underlings often panic. Regardless, I wasn't likely to make it out of the woods alive. I thought deeply about the circumstances which led me there. I had been the one who violated the agreement and broke the rules. I was in their territory. Against every instinct I held dear, I lowered my weapon as a sign of contrition. The posture of the pack immediately changed. The alpha male stepped back slightly. Then all the others followed suit, breaking the tense stalemate. Eventually they all fell back, out of sight. To much greater surprise, my two missing children appeared from the same general direction. I surmised that the majestic wolves who walk upright had been holding them captive until I came to answer for their careless trespass. I was glad that I found a peaceful resolution to being cornered by them. I am sure there would have been a very different outcome otherwise. My children and I walked back home in virgin silence. No angry words needed to be spoken, nor threats made. I saw the mortal depth of fear and greater understanding in their remorseful eyes. Never again would I have to worry about them or their younger siblings wandering into the highland woods. No doubt they would impart the importance of honoring the territorial border with my two youngest children. It was a valuable lesson for all of us. Second story. Who's afraid of a little werewolf? This story is actually real, though in the end everything turned out to have a fairly logical explanation, but I will get to that. It was about two years ago, I was about 21 at the time. That summer, a few friends and I would often go camping in the forest near our hometown. I have this old 1968 Chevy G, tin van which has been super reliable over the years, and we had started a kind of tradition of taking it along straight into the woods with us on our trips. It was really nice to have transportation close by, and we didn't have to carry our tents and camping supplies very far. Besides, my Great Dane got scared easily, and walking him through a dark forest was more trouble than it was worth. We would roast hot dogs, tell stories, and generally just goof around. This particular night was the same as most weekends. The girls, Virginia and Diana, roasting some hot dogs. I was getting the tent set up. I bought this stupid folding tent for my dog, and he was in no help in putting it together. My best friend, Fred, was standing around talking and watching the food cook. Well, soon the hot dogs finished and man was I hungry. Right as we were about to eat, though, we heard this piercing howl. When it comes to supernatural stuff, let's just say over the years my friends and I have had more than our fair share. We often would stumble into these situations where things would just get really weird. So given our history on these trips, we all got a bit freaked out by this howl. Especially when we looked into the undergrowth nearby and saw a pair of eyes staring back. Diana suggested it was a wolf, but we checked it out anyway against my wishes. Sure enough, 
We found the tracks of a wolf or large dog. The only problem? It was obvious that these tracks were made on two legs. Fred was the kind of guy who wanted to prove the supernatural with more zeal than I can believe, so he obviously suggested it was a werewolf. I didn't want to get into this situation, but next thing I know we are trudging through the woods looking for clues to where the dog, or whatever had gone. I still remember so well as the woods gave way to a foggy clearing, and through the mist I could make out a black iron fence with those spear point tips that you might see around a garden. In this case it was around a cemetery. No problem. Hanging around Fred I have been in my share of cemeteries and am not afraid of them outright. Still, I have to admit it was pretty creepy. The gnarled branches of the dead trees stuck out of the fog like skeletal hands grasping from the mists of the river Styx. Okay, maybe I was a little freaked out at this point, but it was about to get a lot worse. Next thing I know, I was staring down into an open grave and Fred was reading the headstone aloud. Here lies Silas Osterholt, half man, half wolf. Well, let's just say I was already half gone to get back to my van when Fred grabbed my shoulders. This is our first real clue. We can't leave now. I let him know that I wasn't about to follow the tracks leading away from the tombstone, which matched the ones near our campsite. Because if there was a werewolf zombie out there that had crawled out of this grave, I didn't want any part of it. I am not even sure they heard my protests. And as always we were off to solve this paranormal mystery. Fred had a way about him that just made you want to follow him. And against every instinct I pumped my legs in their direction as they continued to trek after this beast. We found more tracks in some mud further in the woods and followed them to an old, run-down flour mill. The second we got to the doorway, another of those freaking howls started. I could feel it piercing to my bones, but they all decided the best course of action was to go in anyway. We are all smart people, especially Diana. But there we were walking into this crumbling flour mill chasing what was at best a large dog and at worst a werewolf from beyond the grave. It was clear this werewolf didn't have a maid. This place was covered in spider webs, dust, and would be best described as just generally gray. Soon enough, we were splitting up to explore the place. The ladies went with Fred. Me and my dog went off in the opposite direction. I figured since I didn't get to eat my hot dogs I could grab a snack while they searched the place. I figured if there were a wolf in here, we would hear it by now. Besides, this place actually seemed pretty cool. I found an old mask hanging on the wall. It looked African in origin. I decided to grab it and head back to find my pals. As I pulled it off the wall, I heard a thump behind me, but when I turned around there was nothing there. This obviously freaked me out, so I put the mask back and started jogging back in the direction of my friends. Well, this part of the story I got from Virginia later. Apparently, Fred had discovered more wolf tracks in the dust, leading straight into a wall. After doing a bit of searching, they found a switch that revealed a secret door, leading to a small room with a single table, a chair, and a map. The map was crude, showing the general layout of the forest. There were three X's drawn on the map, and one was labeled Mill. Just after finding it, Fred and the ladies came face to face with our wolf. It had less hair than you might expect, and its flesh was a rotten green color. It stood as Fred had suggested, on two legs. They knocked down a stack of crates on the beast and booked it out of there. As I was coming back to tell them about the sweet mask and strange sounds, they ran straight into me and my pup. Hitting the floor, I saw the thing's shadow approaching our corner. Things got real very fast. Next thing I know, my legs are going like rockets and my dog is right beside me. The others must have run a different direction, but the beast decided I was the more appetizing one and gave chase. I grabbed my dog and hid under a crate over a spot of particularly rotten floor. I kicked it through just as the monster found us, 
and my dog and I tumbled down to the next level of the building. I was so frantic I had no idea what to do, and my dog was being cowardly as ever. Who could blame him? We ran up a set of nearby stairs, and my eyes fell to rest on a large water hose, the kind built into the walls of industrial mills like this one in case of fires. I turned that hose on the beast as it topped the stairs, knocking it straight back down them. I jumped onto a nearby ladder, dog over my shoulders, and climbed for my life. The thing was back up the stairs and I could see its red eyes glowing with what was certainly a sentient hatred. This thing wanted to kill me, and I wasn't going to wait around. As I reached the roof of the mill, I saw the thing start to climb the ladder. I did the only smart thing and hopped down to a lower section of the building that was directly over the water wheel. The wheel was not too big, and I could tell that if I could cross it I could get to a nearby window and hopefully ditch this creature which by now had reached the upper roof. The dog and I ran across the water wheel, which felt a lot like running on an unstable treadmill, and I grabbed him and jumped headfirst through that window. We ended up in some kind of storage room filled with bags of wool. I covered us in a pile of the stuff and hoped the thing didn't find me. Next thing I know, my friends walk in and mistake us for monsters as we start crawling out of the wool to greet them. Before I can get it out of my mouth to stop them, they took off running, again, and so I ran after to find them. They were hiding in freaking barrels that had these weird rubber tubes sticking out of the top like snorkels. I knew they were there because the tubing was shaking around with their movements. They are lucky it was me looking and not the wolf thing. Diana noted all the things that were suspicious here. Secret room, the map, the wool, the barrels with rubber tubing, and obviously the werewolf slash zombie slash ghost thing. Fred said he was determined to get to the bottom of it and set off for the exit. We headed out some shipping doors in the back and found a set of railway tracks that lead from a nearby storage building to a dock on the river with an empty cart rolling by us down to the water. This was most likely originally to haul out flour produced by the mill, but this mill had been out of service quite a while by the look of it. I want to check out where the tracks went while my friends want to see where the tracks originated. I followed the cart and came upon an old, rusty shipping barge. Some king of very large storage container on the barge opened to accept the cart as I got close. I heard a sound behind me and through the fog saw as the monster threw a large barrel straight at my head. It missed by a couple feet and landed just behind me, so I jumped as it rolled under me. I landed on the barrel and ran on it for about two seconds as it rolled. Probably the most skillful balancing act I have ever pulled off. I grabbed a hook from a ship-to-shore loading crane and swung like freaking Tarzan, scooping my dog up. I must have looked like Indiana Jones or something, but I honestly don't normally have that kind of skill. Funny what you can do when adrenaline is pumping. That heroism ended fast as I slammed into a small shack on the shore. Running inside, I found a basement area down a ladder, so down I went, heavy dog on my back. I followed a tunnel I found and hoped it would lead to my friends. As all this was going on, they had been following the tracks in the other direction. I heard them talking above me as they searched, and I knew my tunnel was directly under them. I walked below their feet until I found a ladder and popped up on them. I told them about what I found, the electric barge that opened to catch the carts. For whatever reason, they didn't believe me. I took them back through the tunnel and showed them in person. A cart approached and a section of the barge opened just as before. The cart went in and so did we. Inside was a room full of those strange barrels with the rubber tubing. Soon enough, we also saw the monster. He was outside this section of the ship, fishing one of those strange barrels out of the river. He carried it inside and placed it on the newly arrived cart. I was sure I could hear a sheep from inside the barrel. Fred decided that he wanted to capture the beast, and in order to catch him, 
We would need to get inside the next barrel as it came down the river. They were planning to use the crane hook, the one from my heroic escape earlier which they also didn't believe, to catch the beast when I popped out of the barrel, but obviously such a stupid plan didn't work out. Instead, I just pushed my barrel back into the river after the crane inevitably missed the mark and hoped the thing didn't eat me. It started giving chase in a small raft that was on the barge. At this point, it was clear that this thing was as smart as a human. It was also clear that this river gave way to a waterfall very soon. My loyal but terrified pup jumped into the water and pulled me out just before the falls. The werewolf wasn't so lucky. His raft snagged on a rock just as he went over the falls and he began yelling, in English, for help. We pulled him up from the bank and found that he was just a man in a mask. In fact, he wasn't a werewolf. He was a thief and smuggler. He was using the old mill to move stolen livestock and used the costume to frighten off anyone who came along out here. They would float the stolen livestock and stolen goods from further up the river and he would catch the barrels and ship them out to the black stock market or wherever you sell stolen livestock. Sure, it didn't turn out to be paranormal. I have to say, though, this was one of the more frightening camping trips I have taken. Third story. Who's afraid of a little werewolf? This story is actually real, though in the end everything turned out to have a fairly logical explanation, but I will get to that. It was about two years ago. I was about 21 at the time. That summer, a few friends and I would often go camping in the forest near our hometown. I have this old 1968 Chevy G, tin van which has been super reliable over the years and we had started a kind of tradition of taking it along straight into the woods with us on our trips it was really nice to have transportation close by and we didn't have to carry our tents and camping supplies very far besides my great dane got scared easily and walking him through a dark forest was more trouble than it was worth we would roast hot dogs tell stories and generally just goof around. This particular night was the same as most weekends. The girls, Virginia and Diana, roasting some hot dogs. I was getting the tents set up. I bought this stupid folding tent for my dog, and he was in no help in putting it together. My best friend, Fred, was standing around talking and watching the food cook. Well, soon the hot dogs finished and man was I hungry. Right as we were about to eat, though, we heard this piercing howl. When it comes to supernatural stuff, let's just say over the years my friends and I have had more than our fair share. We often would stumble into these situations where things would just get really weird. So given our history on these trips, we all got a bit freaked out by this howl. Especially when we looked into the undergrowth nearby and saw a pair of eyes staring back. Diana suggested it was a wolf, but we checked it out anyway against my wishes. Sure enough, we found the tracks of a wolf or large dog. The only problem? It was obvious that these tracks were made on two legs. Fred was the kind of guy who wanted to prove the supernatural with more zeal than I can believe, so he obviously suggested it was a werewolf. I didn't want to get into this situation, but next thing I know we are trudging through the woods looking for clues to where the dog, or whatever had gone. I still remember so well as the woods gave way to a foggy clearing, and through the mist I could make out a black iron fence with those spear point tips that you might see around a garden. In this case it was around a cemetery. No problem, hanging around Fred I have been in my share of cemeteries and am not afraid of them outright. Still. I have to admit it was pretty creepy. The gnarled branches of the dead trees stuck out of the fog like skeletal hands grasping from the mists of the river sticks. Okay, maybe I was a little freaked out at this point, but it was about to get a lot worse. Next thing I know, I was staring down into an open grave and Fred was reading the headstone aloud. Here lies Silas Osterholt, half man, half wolf. Well, let's just say I was already half gone to get back to my van when Fred grabbed my shoulders. 
This is our first real clue. We can't leave now. I let him know that I wasn't about to follow the tracks leading away from the tombstone, which matched the ones near our campsite. Because if there was a werewolf zombie out there that had crawled out of this grave, I didn't want any part of it. I am not even sure they heard my protests, and as always we were off to solve this paranormal mystery. Fred had a way about him that just made you want to follow him, and against every instinct I pumped my legs in their direction as they continued to trek after this beast. We found more tracks and some mud further in the woods, and followed them to an old, run-down flour mill. The second we got to the doorway, another of those freaking howls started. I could feel it piercing to my bones, but they all decided the best course of action was to go in anyway. We are all smart people, especially Diana. But there we were walking into this crumbling flour mill chasing what was at best a large dog and at worst a werewolf from beyond the grave. It was clear this werewolf didn't have a maid. This place was covered in spider webs, dust, and would be best described as just generally gray. Soon enough, we were splitting up to explore the place. The ladies went with Fred, me and my dog went off in the opposite direction. I figured since I didn't get to eat my hot dogs I could grab a snack while they searched the place. I figured if there were a wolf in here, we would hear it by now. Besides, this place actually seemed pretty cool. I found an old mask hanging on the wall. It looked African in origin. I decided to grab it and head back to find my pals. As I pulled it off the wall, I heard a thump behind me, but when I turned around there was nothing there. This obviously freaked me out, so I put the mask back and started jogging back in the direction of my friends. Well, this part of the story I got from Virginia later. Apparently, Fred had discovered more wolf tracks in the dust, leading straight into a wall. After doing a bit of searching, they found a switch that revealed a secret door, leading to a small room with a single table, a chair, and a map. The map was crude, showing the general layout of the forest. There were three X's drawn on the map, and one was labeled Mill. Just after finding it, Fred and the ladies came face to face with our wolf. It had less hair than you might expect, and its flesh was a rotten green color. It stood, as Fred had suggested, on two legs. They knocked down a stack of crates on the beast and booked it out of there. As I was coming back to tell them about the sweet mask and strange sounds, they ran straight into me and my pup. Hitting the floor, I saw the thing's shadow approaching our corner. Things got real very fast. Next thing I know, my legs are going like rockets and my dog is right beside me. The others must have run a different direction, but the beast decided I was the more appetizing one and gave chase. I grabbed my dog and hid under a crate over a spot of particularly rotten floor. I kicked it through just as the monster found us, and my dog and I tumbled down to the next level of the building. I was so frantic I had no idea what to do, and my dog was being cowardly as ever, who could blame him? We ran up a set of nearby stairs, and my eyes fell to rest on a large water hose, the kind built into the walls of industrial mills like this one in case of fires. I turned that hose on the beast as it topped the stairs, knocking it straight back down them. I jumped onto a nearby ladder, dog over my shoulders, and climbed for my life. The thing was back up the stairs and I could see its red eyes glowing with what was certainly a sentient hatred. This thing wanted to kill me, and I wasn't going to wait around. As I reached the roof of the mill, I saw the thing start to climb the ladder. I did the only smart thing and hopped down to a lower section of the building that was directly over the water wheel. The wheel was not too big and I could tell that if I could cross it I could get to a nearby window and hopefully ditch this creature which by now had reached the upper roof. The dog and I ran across the water wheel, which felt a lot like running on an unstable treadmill, and I grabbed him and jumped headfirst through that window. We ended up in some kind of storage room filled with bags of wool. I covered us in a pile of the stuff 
and hope the thing didn't find me. Next thing I know, my friends walk in and mistake us for monsters as we start crawling out of the wool to greet them. Before I can get it out of my mouth to stop them, they took off running, again, and so I ran after to find them. They were hiding in freaking barrels that had these weird rubber tubes sticking out of the top like snorkels. I knew they were there because the tubing was shaking around with their movements. They are lucky it was me looking and not the wolf thing. Diana noted all the things that were suspicious here. Secret room, the map, the wool, the barrels with rubber tubing, and obviously the werewolf slash zombie slash ghost thing. Fred said he was determined to get to the bottom of it and set off for the exit. We headed out some shipping doors in the back and found a set of railway tracks that lead from a nearby storage building to a dock on the river, with an empty cart rolling by us down to the water. This was most likely originally to haul out flour produced by the mill, but this mill had been out of service quite a while by the look of it. I want to check out where the tracks went, while my friends want to see where the tracks originated. I followed the cart and came upon an old, rusty shipping barge. Some king of very large storage container on the barge opened to accept the cart as I got close. I heard a sound behind me and through the fog saw as the monster threw a large barrel straight at my head. It missed by a couple feet and landed just behind me, so I jumped as it rolled under me. I landed on the barrel and ran on it for about two seconds as it rolled. Probably the most skillful balancing act I have ever pulled off. I grabbed a hook from a ship-to-shore loading crane and swung like freaking Tarzan, scooping my dog up. I must have looked like Indiana Jones or something, but I honestly don't normally have that kind of skill. Funny what you can do when adrenaline is pumping. That heroism ended fast as I slammed into a small shack on the shore. Running inside, I found a basement area down a ladder, so down I went, heavy dog on my back. I followed a tunnel I found and hoped it would lead to my friends. As all this was going on, they had been following the tracks in the other direction. I heard them talking above me as they searched, and I knew my tunnel was directly under them. I walked below their feet until I found a ladder and popped up on them. I told them about what I found, the electric barge that opened to catch the carts. For whatever reason, they didn't believe me. I took them back through the tunnel and showed them in person. A cart approached, and a section of the barge opened just as before. The cart went in, and so did we. Inside was a room full of those strange barrels with the rubber tubing. Soon enough, we also saw the monster. He was outside this section of the ship, fishing one of those strange barrels out of the river. He carried it inside and placed it on the newly arrived cart. I was sure I could hear a sheep from inside the barrel. Fred decided that he wanted to capture the beast, and in order to catch him, we would need to get inside the next barrel as it came down the river. They were planning to use the crane hook, the one from my heroic escape earlier which they also didn't believe, to catch the beast when I popped out of the barrel, but obviously such a stupid plan didn't work out. Instead, I just pushed my barrel back into the river after the crane inevitably missed the mark and hoped the thing didn't eat me. It started giving chase in a small raft that was on the barge. At this point, it was clear that this thing was as smart as a human. It was also clear that this river gave way to a waterfall very soon. My loyal but terrified pup jumped into the water and pulled me out just before the falls. The werewolf wasn't so lucky. His raft snagged on a rock just as he went over the falls and he began yelling, in English, for help. We pulled him up from the bank and found that he was just a man in a mask. In fact, he wasn't a werewolf. He was a thief and smuggler. He was using the old mill to move stolen livestock and used the costume to frighten off anyone who came along out here. They would float the stolen livestock and stolen goods from further up the river, and he would catch the barrels and ship them out to the black stock market, or wherever you sell stolen livestock. Sure, 
It didn't turn out to be paranormal. I have to say, though, this was one of the more frightening camping trips I have taken. Fourth story. Real-life werewolves. On the chance that those who are able to physically shapeshift, i.e. shifters, werewolves, etc., or those that have seen them are lurking on this subreddit, I'll ask, do any of you have either direct or indirect experience with physical shapeshifting, even if only minor? Please don't bother trying to convince me that it's impossible, as I've seen it done twice before. Looking forward to seeing if anyone here wants to share. Alternatively, if you'd feel more comfortable, you can DM me. Edit. By popular request, I will elaborate on my observations of shape-shifting. Here is an excerpt from a report I wrote on a case I witnessed. It's written from the perspective of self-reporting, but I have witnessed the shift up to the point that it wouldn't be safe due to the potential for injury. The subject describes his condition as beginning with a sort of vibration, the description of which is superficially similar to Meniere's disease, characterized by fluctuating tinnitus and vertigo. As this intensifies, the resultant vertigo produces intense nausea followed by prolonged and repeated vomiting. Subsequently, there is markedly excessive sweating coupled with violent shivering, together referred to as rigors that are characteristic of circulatory shock. These subside and are replaced by global fasciculations paired to an intense, intermittent, colicky, abdominal cramping. The cramps migrate towards the chest and then outwards to the superficial tissues and skin, which spread into the neck and head. The muscle cramping in the head leads to a perception of auras not dissimilar from those experienced by epileptics. The vomiting returns, accompanied by severe nosebleeds and coughing up of blood. The intermittent abdominal cramping worsens to a point where the subject is no longer able to focus, and there is a simultaneous intense ringing in the ears. Toothaches begin at this time, culminating in bleeding gums as the teeth elongate and, to some extent, sharpen. This is accompanied by a pulsating sensation across the musculature of the entire body, which is followed by global paresthesia. Vision worsens as nystagmus begins to develop. The spine then begins to destabilize, stretched beyond a safe degree, at which point spontaneous bone fractures begin in the clavicular region. The subject generally loses consciousness at this point, but occasionally remains aware of his surroundings long enough to see his hands transform to some extent, although he could not elaborate. Witnesses describe the final resulting form as being of the typical anthropomorphic werewolf variety. Fifth story. How's low-cost thrift and consignment? The worst part about insomnia is the boredom. Nothing open except for the seedy places. Nobody awake except for the seedy people. Nothing to do except watch movies and eat sunflower seeds. Seriously, fuck insomnia. My sleep capacity generally comes and goes in waves, but the few weeks before I found Hal's were especially rough. There was no inciting incident, just that general feeling of restlessness and anxiety that has become a familiar friend over the years. I tried all of the standard assists, warm milk, old movies, cut down on my caffeine intake, all the usual things that people recommend but never work. Eventually, more out of boredom than anything else, I took to taking late night walks through the city. I worked a shitty job as a projectionist at a local movie theater, and on the weekends I didn't often get off work until the last movie finished and the city had long since wound down by the time I was free. The first week or two I stayed towards the well-lit areas populated by the intoxicated, both rich and poor. But while the people watching was always good, I quickly grew tired of the relentless noise and began wandering off the beaten path. I'm not sure how I'd never noticed Hal's before. I distinctly remembered buying smokes at the dilapidated gas station across the street on several occasions, 
and I'm sure my eyes would have been drawn to the large storefront windows still brightly lit and welcoming at 3 a.m. The neon sign pronouncing it Hal's low-cost thrift and consignment glowed in garishly conflicting colors, except for the first S, which was burnt out. Of course, I would come to realize that there were very good reasons I had never seen it before, but that first night I wondered if maybe I was hallucinating from sleep deprivation. I entered, of course. Even if I didn't feel the need to validate that the whole thing wasn't just a figment of my imagination, there was no way I was denying my curiosity. It was probably the smell that I noticed first. Kind of a combination of burning sage and rancid meat, but in a weirdly good kind of way. Best thing I can compare it to is a beach bonfire at low tide. The place was packed full of merchandise. All displayed very neatly on row after row of shelving, but without any sign of clear organization. Knickknacks sat on the same shelves as old magazines and jumper cables. A bizarre collection of artwork decorated the walls, from shadow boxes holding sports paraphernalia to Pink Floyd posters to copies of famous Impressionist paintings. The wall furthest from the front entrance was actually just an unbroken line of doors. Each door was crafted in an entirely different style, and each painted a different color to create a full-length pride flag along the wall. In the center, the green door actually appeared to be an elevator, which really just raised additional questions. I began to browse the first aisle to the left of the front door. A full silver-plated dining set, a clown costume, a chainsaw without a chain, for cookbooks, a Super Soaker XP 100 already filled with water, several fake antique-looking religious relics such as crosses and Buddha heads, and a full-length evening cloak that made me immediately start contemplating a career as a supervillain if for no other reason than I would look amazing in it. I browsed several more aisles with a bemused smile on my face as the truly eclectic inventory continued to defy any clear organizational sense until a gruff voice cleared its throat. I glanced up to see the shopkeeper behind the front counter staring at me. He was a medium-sized man, but held a clear, don't fuck with me aura around him. His head was shaved bald and his arms and shoulders indicated someone who had spent more than a few years working in trades. Can I help you find something? He asked his voice a low grumble that ran the line between professionalism and wanting to throw your ass to the curb. I shot him one of my patented disarming smiles. Not really, I'm just browsing. He continued to stare for a moment, his eyes probing as if searching for a way to sort me into one of the Jungian archetypes that all retail employees have for their customers. Incubus? He asked, finally. Excuse me? Are you an incubus? He responded, his eyes still searching mine. No, Jim and I. Actually, well, on the cusp with cancer. Really? I didn't think people actually use the astrology pickup in real life. I gotta ask, do you get a lot of success with that one? With nostalgia being all the rage these days, going for one of the classic pickup lines is actually a brilliant idea. The corner of the man's mouth twitched just for a moment before returning to its painted-on scowl. That immediately put me at ease. Couldn't work the late-night shift without having that hard shell of an exterior, but if I could touch a sense of humor, he probably wouldn't be throwing me out anytime soon. I don't get a lot of people coming in here just to browse, he said, his voice having moved slightly away from the gravelly grumble he was using before. Less Bob Dylan, more Bob's Burgers. Most know exactly what they want by the time they lay eyes on this place. I shrugged. What can I say? I'm an impulsive sort. Hey, how much is this? I lifted up a snow globe that held what looked like a large hospital. The shopkeeper raised an eyebrow. Good eye. That's two hundred dollars. I whistled immediately placing it carefully back on the rack. Pricey for a paperweight. Collector's item. There are a lot of stories inside that little snow globe. 
You could probably get a couple thousand from the right buyer if you're fine dealing with that kind of person. I take it since you're selling it for $200, you're not fine with that? The corner of the shopkeeper's mouth twitched again. I could tell he was warming to me. I'm pretty sure you're not here for that old thing anyways. What am I here for then? I'm not sure yet. Keep browsing. I'm sure you'll find it. I did as I was told. An antique set of writing quills, what looked like a defunct Tesla coil, a compass and a sextant, a typewriter, a VCR, a few old board games I had never heard of and a few other raggedy children's toys, including an actual raggedy and doll. Nothing really struck my fancy until I was flipping through a rack of clothing and came across a treasure. I delightedly snatched it up and approached the front counter, placing it in front of the shopkeeper. He raised another eyebrow at me, and I beamed a smile at him in return. I've always wanted one of these. I chortled. The shopkeep shook his head and pressed a few buttons on the archaic register. Not Fay then. Never met a Fay with a decent sense of humor. For the white t-shirt with I'm with stupid written on it, that'll be a buck fifty-three. I fished a handful of coins out of my pocket and counted out exact change. He took it and sorted the money into the correct slots. He looked back up at me and shook his head. This has got to be the dumbest sale I've made this year. I'm not even sure why that was on the rack. Hey, I'm not complaining, I said, pulling the new purchase over the shirt I was already wearing. Did you just open? I walk by this area pretty often and I'm sure I've never seen you here before. The man's smile came out fully into the open. Yes and no. We've been in business for a long time, but I guess you could say we're new to the area. Well, I hope you stick around for a while, Hal, I said, nodding with feigned understanding as I extended my hand. You've got a bunch of weird shit in here, and there aren't many other places for me to go shopping at this time of night. Butch! the shopkeeper replied, shaking my outstretched hand. Excuse me? My name's Butch, not Hal. What the hell would the owner be doing working the front counter at 3 a.m.? I threw my head back and laughed. I stand corrected. Butch grinned. So not an incubus, not a fay, not a vamp. What the hell are you doing in my shop? I raised an eyebrow. Buying vintage clothing apparently. No, seriously. What's your deal? Shapeshifter? Wendigo? Cannibal? Dude, I've worked enough retail to know all about the normal customer archetypes, but I think you've lost me on these. Is a shapeshifter one of those shoplifters who keeps showing up in different clothes like they're actually fooling anyone? Butch looked at me in perplexity, but a little bell rang announcing the arrival of another customer before he could continue his line of questioning. We both glanced towards the door instinctually, and I suddenly also began wondering what the hell I was doing in this store. The woman who had just entered was tall. Disturbingly tall. At least that was my first impression. I soon realized, though, that she wasn't actually tall, she was just floating a solid two feet off the ground. She wore a long, pale white and semi-transparent dress that fell clearly past her feet and dragged gently on the floor. A white veil was pinned to her unkempt mane of dark hair and spread across her face. That veil did nothing to disguise the bloodshot and sorrowful eyes, the broken nose, nor the mouth that hung open to the center of her chest leaving a large black void from her cracked and broken top teeth to well past her neck. I recoiled in horror, slipping and falling directly onto my ass before scooting myself back until my back hit a rack of shelves and a hairy, taxidermied hand fell onto my lap. I held up it up in preparation to do battle should I need to. The specter, however paid me absolutely no mind. She merely glided down one of the aisles, raised her hand to delicately select something off a shelf, and then floated back up to Butch's counter. Evening, Maeve. Just the usual? Butch asked casually. 
The woman's cavernous mouth seemed to open wider and a reverberating moan began to vibrate my soul. It wasn't loud, but it suddenly reminded me of the sound I heard my mother make over my grandfather's deathbed when I was nine years old. All right, gorgeous, it's 4.50. The woman in white reached out a hand limply and dropped a handful of crumpled bills on the counter. She then turned and slowly glided out of the door. My shaking hands continued to point the furry limb at her long past the point she was out of sight. Throat lozenges, stated Butch. I swept the leg to point at him, my heart still racing and my eyes wide. Butch seemed unconcerned. Maeve comes in every night for a pack. Her work leaves her throat pretty sore. I'm not sure if they do much good, but it's always the regulars who keep a business afloat. That was a fucking banshee. I almost screamed. Butch's eyebrows raised as though impressed. Wow. He said, I'm impressed. Most humans wouldn't recognize one on sight. Hey, could you stop pointing that thing at me? They can get a little unpredictable if you're not used to them. I kept my impromptu weapon trained on him for another moment before allowing my hand, still tightly clenched, to fall into my lap. I continued to breathe shakily for another moment and try to get my head straight. I'm sorry. I said once I felt like I could speak without screaming. That was really not something I expected to see tonight. What the fuck, Butch? Banshees are fucking real? And they come in here every night for pharyngitis treatment? What the fuck is this place? I realized my voice was starting to gain volume again. I stopped, swallowed, and took another raspy breath. Sorry. I said again. I've never reacted well when I get really scared. Believe me, I wish that didn't happen to me. But dash, the thing still clasped in my hand suddenly lurched. I curiously glanced down at it, only just then fully noticing what I had been clenching in my fist. This is a monkey's paw, isn't it? Yeah, you may want to put that down before you make another wish, said Butch an amused smile on his face. Why, what did I say? Still scared? Of what? Oh, right, ugly banshee chick. Nah, I'm good now. Why do my pants smell bad? Butch rolled his eyes. Go ahead and grab a new pair. No chatty. Nice. Can I use your bathroom? He nodded towards the far wall of the shop. Purple door. I'd avoid opening any others if I were you. Spoil sport. Is that elevator real? Yep. And no, I'm not answering any follow-up questions until I can't smell you anymore. Ten minutes later, I was feeling much cleaner, if slightly chilly, in my newly bought I'm with stupid t-shirt and newly gifted cum slut booty shorts. I must have been starting to grow on Butch because other than another twitch of his mouth and slight shake of his head, he didn't much react to my change in style. So you're actually just straight human, aren't you? He asked ruefully. I can't think of another species that would so flagrantly disregard their own self-respect. Never seen the video of the otter raping a decapitated fish head, have you? You know what I mean. Even the blood orgy folk will still show up in something tailored at least. Butch, you just had a floating girl in here wearing funeral clothes. Versace. Maeve's taste is old-fashioned, but always quality. I paused with my mouth open, before shutting it slowly. All right then. I guess he's done corrected. Should I change so I don't offend the blood orgy folk? I finally got a full laugh from Butch. What's your name, kid? Clear. Sadi. Clear. Middle name is Water. My parents were hippies. Also big fans of revivals. Man thought I drew the short straw when it came to names. But you've got me beat. So what? The shop bell rang again. Unlike with the previous customer. I felt not even the slightest twinge of fear as the latest monster strolled casually into the building. 
six and a half feet tall and covered in reddish-brown fur. The man with the overtly canine face was sporting a cordial grin. The werewolf nodded casually at Butch and began strolling the aisles. Butch nodded back and then raised an eyebrow at me, as though interested in my newfound stoicism. Well, he asked, as if unsure whether or not I was going to shit myself again. I can't believe you gave me a hard time about my booty shorts and then didn't blink at that guy dropping werewolf dong. Butch grunted in satisfaction. Guess that monkey's paw was the real deal. I should bump up the price. You didn't know? He shook his head. It's good policy not to fuck around with a monkey's paw. Had a feeling it was legit, though. A lot of the other stuff we got from that particular estate ended up being pretty extraordinary. There was a pause. Such as, I demanded, come on dude, you can't drop that line and then not show off a bit. Butch laughed again and turned around to the display wall behind the counter. He pulled down a shadow box and laid it on the counter in front of me. Inside was an almost cartoonishly large revolver. Six chamber, but with a bulbous barrel that could have fired a ski ball. There were three huge rounds already loaded, but with no caliber that I recognized. You seem like the kind of guy who would appreciate this. He opened the case and gestured for me to pick it up. I did, immediately surprised by its apparent weightlessness. I spun it around my finger, gunslinger style, and leveled it harmlessly towards the doors at the end of the hall. The werewolf glanced up at me curiously for a moment before returning to his shopping. Love the way it handles, but I don't recognize the make. One of a kind, Butch said. They call it the Chekhov gun. I laughed. Seriously? Guess I have to fire it then. Huh? Probably, but I wouldn't waste the ammo if you don't have to. Those three rounds are all there are left. How very hackneyed, I said, examining one of the rounds. These things seem a bit unnecessary, unless you're hunting kaiju. What are they? I've just taken to calling them MacGuffins. I've only seen it used once, during a debate over the bathroom being only for paying customers. One thing led to another, and a full army of vampires ended up laying siege to the shop. Had to have been at least four or five hundred of them. Hell shot off around from this, and it fired an actual sun. Gave me second-degree burns on every exposed inch of skin, but it fried every last one of those retards. Wait, it shoots a sun? I asked incredulously, cautiously setting the gun back on the counter. No, it shoots whatever it has to to get the job done, Butch explained. That makes no sense whatsoever. You do realize there's a werewolf browsing through old Megadeth CDs ten feet behind you, right? I turned around and locked eyes with the large hairy fellow for a moment. His tongue lolled out of the side of his mouth in a wolfish smile, and he winked at me. I mean, I get what you're saying, but I still think there's a big difference between ancient legends and a relatively modern literary construct. Butch opened his mouth to respond. But at that moment the door slammed open with enough force to cause the lights to flicker. I glanced over my shoulder at the darkened doorway, noticing Butch's hand move to rest lightly on the Chekhov gun on the counter. The werewolf's hackles raised as a low growl began to rumble from his direction. The man in the doorway seemed human enough. If high-stakes lawyers could be considered human, that is, he was tall, but not intimidatingly so. His suit was well-tailored, his hair immaculate. The charming smile on his face belied the cold contempt in his eyes. Hey Butch, he said, his voice a purring baritone. Hey AZ, long time no see, Butch replied, his face devoid of emotion. Way too long. The man pulled a coin from his pocket and began rolling it back and forth across his fingers. Is your boss around? You know I haven't seen Hal in months, AZ. Not since that incident with the purgatory delegation. 
Paychecks are still rolling in though, so he's out there somewhere. If you find him, let him know I'm taking the fender for a Christmas bonus. AZ shook his head in feigned disappointment. It really would be in your best interest to help me track him down, Butch. You know the deal he made to run this place expired at the end of last month. Now my employer has a lot of respect for the old man and everything he's done over the years, so he's more than willing to renegotiate the terms. Butch shook his head. You're not hearing me, AZ. I don't know where the guy is, and I don't have any way of getting a hold of him. Come on, you really mean to tell me your boss can't SUS out where he is? I'm starting to get why his little rebellion failed. Still not sure how he duped all you idiots into following his lead, though. Was that like a Trump thing? That's low even for you, Butch. I laughed involuntarily. I dunno, man. If the mega hat fits, suddenly a force slammed into me, hurling me over the counter and against the wall behind the register. Shock shuddered through my body as a display hook pierced my shoulder. A flood of moisture spread down my back, and I immediately started feeling a little woozy. Also a lot pissed. I jerked my head up to glare at AZ. Motherfucker, I just bought this shirt. I felt myself reverse direction, flying off the wall and across the store. I flailed painfully as I soared, managing to tip over one of the racks before colliding with the werewolf. I couldn't help but marvel at how soft he was as we hit the floor and slid into another rack, bringing its contents down on us. I always envisioned werewolf fur as being more coarse, I thought as I waited out the falling inventory. Sorry, Jack, I muttered, rolling away from the werewolf and painfully climbing to my feet. Cool if I call you Jack? Never caught your actual name? Jack growled, shaking his head like a wet dog. I don't know why you have to make me hurt your friends before you tell me what I want to know, Butch. You know how much it pains me to hurt innocent bystanders. Butch was levitating over the cash register, his limbs shaking violently as he appeared to reflexively attempt to swallow his own tongue. I started grabbing anything within reach and throwing it at AZ. I managed to score a direct hit with a tea kettle and an old computer mouse, but it was the lawn dart directly to the head that finally got his attention. Butch took in a raspy breath and fell to the ground as AZ's head spun around to glare at me. His hand shot up and I felt my windpipe close. My hands instinctively went to my neck as I tried desperately to take in air. Idiot child, rasped AZ, his eyes appearing a dull red as the edges of my vision began to darken. Do you have any idea who you're? I lost the rest of his sentence as Jack launched himself into AZ and the two of them flew into another rack. I fell to my knees sucking in air and letting the world come back into focus. It sounded like Jack got one or two good swipes in with his vicious-looking claws before he flew backwards again, crashing through one of the doors at the back of the store. What lay beyond remained unknown, as the door immediately reformed behind him, pulling back in its shattered wood until no trace of damage remained. AZ's head came bobbing into sight over the racks. I got back to my feet. This whole lack of fear thing was really starting to grow on me. You can force choke me all you want, Vader. I snarled at him. We both know you're just a whiny little sand-hating bitch. Izzy's face was filled with fury as he raised his hand to smite me again. Suddenly Butch stepped between us. The Chekhov gun leveled squarely at Izzy's head. Izzy's look turned to one of contempt but his hand still lowered slightly. How many of those bullets are you down to, Butch? He asked. Two? Three? Are you really sure you want to waste one on little old me? What, then, will you use on the one he sends after me? Or the one after that? Eventually, the big man himself will want to come. Better hope you still have at least one left for him. 
My eyes fell on another gun that had fallen onto the floor in the struggle, one that I had noticed on my first walk through of the aisles. A stupid idea popped into my head. I reached down and grabbed it, cocking it loudly as I leveled it towards AZ. Step aside, Butch, I growled. Butch shot a look back at me, saw what I held, and gave me a tight grin as he lowered the Chekhov gun and stepped out of my way. I squeezed the trigger on the Super Soaker XP-100 and sent a stream of water directly into AZ's face. His scream was piercing as the smoke immediately started pouring off his melting face. I stepped towards him, continuously pumping more water as I adjusted my stream to any piece of exposed skin his squirming left exposed. The power of Christ compels you, bitch. I yelled as I stood over him furiously pumping the squirt gun. Don't fuck with retail workers. Flesh fell from the demon's bones like really good barbecue ribs, bubbling into vapor from the floor. His screams became so high-pitched that I heard a few of the more delicate glass items in the shop shatter. I didn't let up on the stream of water until the plastic toy lost pressure and dribbled to a stop. AZ collapsed, his clothes falling into a pile on the floor as his body steamed away. I stood panting, feeling the adrenaline burning off my skin. My shoulder, forgotten during the fight, began to throb painfully and the squirt gun slipped from my grasp. Did you seriously just use a Pulp Fiction line on me? I looked up at Butch in surprise and started to laugh. I mean... How often am I really going to have an opportunity like that? I just couldn't resist. He chuckled along with me. How'd you know that Super Soaker would work? You made it pretty easy to figure out what he was with all that boss's rebellion talk. And I thought with the kind of shit you have in here, there was a pretty decent chance that thing was filled with holy water. Anyway, if it wasn't, I knew you'd probably just look at me like I was an idiot and shoot him with the Chekhov gun instead. So you know, what the hell? He chuckled again and walked over to me to examine my shoulder. How's it look? I asked through gritted teeth. I mean, you're going to need stitches, probably, but I don't think you're going to bleed out anytime soon. I nodded, then glanced over at the back of the shop towards the door Jack had disappeared through. Is he going to be all right? I asked. Jack? He replied. Yeah, he'll be fine. He's a pretty solid guy. Has friends everywhere. I'm sure someone over there will put him up until he finds his way back. Holy shit. His name really is Jack? I thought I was just being clever. Nobody knows his real name, actually. He doesn't talk much. But most people end up landing on that joke eventually, so it's kind of just stuck. Ow. My self-esteem. I deadpanned. What's over there? Over where? You said someone over there will put him up. What's over there? Oh. That door leads to the back rooms. It opens up somewhere different every time. So you usually have to find another way back if you go through it. I nodded not really understanding, but increasingly distracted by the radiating pain in my shoulder. Well, let me know next time you see him. I think I owe that guy a beer. Next question. Where is the nearest hospital? He grinned. Come on. I'll patch you up. Gotten pretty good at it over the years, working this job. Only lost a couple dozen patients. I nodded and followed as he led to another door behind the cash register. He stopped with his hand on the knob. Oh, and remember how I was trying to figure out why you ended up finding this place? I think I figured it out. Want a job? I looked at him. I thought about the banshee, and the monkey's paw, and the werewolf, and the demon. Then I thought about the long series of dead-end, boring jobs I'd had up until this point. Do you have a dental plan? Thanks a lot for watching the video till the end. Subscribe to our channel Horror in Detail. Drop your opinions slash suggestions in the comment section and like the video as it helps with the YouTube algorithm.